I'm Bob Carter, and welcome to Inside History. Today we have a very, very special show for you. The programs that I have worked on with Inside History up to this point have covered the history of Palm Beach County after the arrival of the white man. But long before the white man arrived in Palm Beach County, we were establishing a history with a culture of people that we're going to hear about today, the Miccosukees and the Seminole Indians. And they were here long before the white men came. Our special guest today is Tony Marconi. And Tony is the curator of education for the Palm Beach County Historical Society. Tony, welcome to Inside History. Thanks for having me, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to talk about one of our education programs, the Traveling Educational Trunk Program. It's a program that's uh, self-contained in a box. As a historian, why do you think this is important for our um, school children to have this information? Well, we should all study different cultures, because mm -hmm. they all bring something to our life to make our life interesting. The Seminoles and Miccosukees have a very rich culture. They came in the 1700s, replacing the early inhabitants. They brought their own culture. They had a, their own society that was well established. But not all societies conform to what, at that time, we think. So we forced changes on other native societies within the United States. So we should study how they lived. Because if you look today, the Seminole tribe of Florida is, is well established within the economy of Florida. They, they, they own the Hard Rock Cafe mm -hmm. that right. they just recently purchased. So we should know about them because they're here and they are the Native Americans that live in this country that we live in. And um, I also understand that when the early white settlers came to Florida, that, in fact, the Native Americans, the Seminoles, and the Miccosukees assisted them in many, many ways as, um, I guess, before mm -hmm. they actually started the Seminole Wars? Yes. The Seminoles and Miccosukees the, from the Creek tribes, when they came down in the 1700s, actually were living under Spanish rule because Spain ruled Florida at that time. Right. They came to fill the empty land they farmed, they had cattle. Uh, they were also a refuge for runaway slaves from mm -hmm. Georgia, right. Alabama, mm -hmm. Carolinas, coming down into, this was free territory to them under Spanish rule. So the Seminoles, you know, would take them in. And we have black Seminoles today. So they, they, they did help them, they helped the Spanish. And then when the United States took over and it became a territory in 1821, we came down and we wanted all their land. And so there was a lot of treaties, you know, pushing them inland in uh, central Florida, uh, paying them off. Uh, and then we wanted to, under the Indian Removal Act in the 1830s, we wanted to just pick them up and move them west of the Mississippi to Indian territory. Right. Some of them did, some of them didn't. And they stayed and fought. And the Second Seminole War was the longest, bloodiest, and most costliest war in the United States history. Up yeah. to that point. Yep, right. that is correct. About $20 million. Wow. I got so excited about doing this program with you today that I wore my Seminole shirt here. And this table is just full of objects and things that are really interesting. The, the tortoise shell. I've heard so much about the endangered tortoises, and sometimes they won't let us develop land because of a rare breed. That is correct. This is just a a turtle shell. It's a, very common. Can I see it? Sure. Very common. It's not endangered. Matter of fact, I w had gone down to the uh, Big Cypress Seminole Reservation and got uh, several of those for our trunks. Mm -hmm. to add. Uh, we also picked up uh, an alligator head. You know, alligators are very big in our society back yes. then and today. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand from the teachers, the boys actually love to uh, play with this. <laughs> Death and destruction. <laughs> right? Absolutely. <laughs> but they do have to be careful because it does have the, the teeth still in it. So I they are a little that. sharp. 
that, and you know, of course, the, the good old alligator claw. Yeah. You know, which they're, which they're able to touch, and they're able to t handle all these these artifacts here. And what about the beadwork and the artwork? Mm -hmm. That's um, Seminole or Miccosukee? Well, these these beaded necklaces actually uh, are Seminole. Again, I picked these up uh, at their museum on the Big Cypress Swamp. Uh, other arts and crafts are the this particular doll, this patchwork doll, and it's made out of palm fiber. You see for the head and for the body, and then they're the patchwork that they are uh, well known for. I noticed that there's a garment over here yes. that has some of the patchwork on it. Can you talk to us about and tell us where it came from? Sure. This, this is Seminole, this patchwork uh, example right here. The shirt is actually Miccosukee. I picked that up uh, on their reservation down in D Dade County. And there's a particular design on the front uh, that you can see on the skirt. Mm -hmm. And that particular design represents a man on horse. And many of their, their patchwork examples have, have meaning. Uh, crawfish, lightning, fire, which are all covered in this program. And I also noticed that the men actually wore what we would consider to be skirts. But in fact, I'm sure they didn't. They were their regular native dress, right? Absolutely. In the early 20th century, they had big shirts that would come down below their knees mm -hmm. and they you know have patchwork designs very colorful uh, designs on on their shirts and they were shirts of course they were almost dress length but the Seminole women wore skirts and then a top mm -hmm. and as time went on of course the shirts got shorter and shorter to what we have today if you go to any one of their reservations and see you know their shirts are you know standard standard length type shirts and they also have jackets too that are, have uh, the patchwork on it. And you say that when you take the trunk into the classroom that you actually allow the students to pass the photographs around in the classroom? Absolutely. Everything in the trunk students can handle and that includes these photographs. They're reproductions of those photographs in our collection. We have a photograph of a, a woman and child. The woman is cooking and her child is standing next to her. She's mm -hmm. bent over. We have other photographs, such as this older woman wearing all her beaded necklaces that she's got, and, you know, covering her neck completely. We have photographs of what the villages look like in the Everglades, uh -huh. uh, showing their chickies, their houses that they lived in, their mode of transportation, the canoes. Mm -hmm that they would have traveled their, their watery world in. Another photograph of a, a woman standing there over her cooking pot, which may be soft key, a seminal dish that they like. We have a portrait of a seminal man dressed up wearing his turban, with the feathers in the turban. This photograph is interesting. It's of a little boy and a girl and if you look at the hairstyle, it can be related right back to the patchwork doll because the hairstyle is very, very similar mm -hmm. between the two. And then we have a photograph of a well-known Seminole. His name was Billy Bowlegs III. He lived to be well over 100 years old. Good for him. And, oh, yes. Yeah. He was uh, well-respected within the, the Seminole tribe. And from this area? He visited this area. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he lived over uh, on the south part of Lake Okeechobee, and he was buried over in that area, mm -hmm. a place called Ortona. There's also some very good artwork here, mm -hmm. um, and some of the people of the tribes. Could you tell us about these people? Sure. The two, piece, the two drawings that we have here are one of a Seminole warrior and one of a very famous Seminole warrior, Osceola, mm -hmm. who led the beginnings of the Second Seminole War when he refused to leave in 1835 when the U.S. government was moving Indians east of the Mississippi to Indian Territory mm -hmm. under the Indian Removal Act, which President Jackson 
had uh, signed off on. Which we know as the Trail of Tears, right? That is correct. And the Seminoles and Miccosukees were part of that. So he refused. And so he attacked um, a general who had thrown him in chains in December 1835, killed him in an aid, while another group of Seminoles massacred Major Dade up in North Central Florida, killing all but three of 105 soldiers in that massacre that lasted several hours of fighting. And so he became the symbol of, of this defiant stance of not wanting to leave their homeland. Like many of us don't want to leave our home. If right. somebody tries to force us, we're going to fight. Well, unfortunately for Osceola, he didn't live to see the end of the war in 1842. 1838, he was a, a prisoner. He had been captured under a white flag of truce, which is, truce. we're taught, yeah, you know, you're not supposed to do that kind of thing. Right. You're there to talk, try to resolve matters between the warring factions. Well, he was a captured, and he was uh, sent to jail, held in St. Augustine, and then he went on to a fort in South Carolina where he died from yeah. illness. Uh, at, he died at an early age. Yes, he was, yeah. he was in his 30s. Wow. Thank you for being with us today. We're going to be right back with some more really interesting information about cultures and societies who lived here in Florida even before the Seminoles and the Miccosukees. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Plastic ones last longer. Pork bellies closed steady due to speculation that demand for bacon-related products. Read me this one, Daddy. Okay, honey. The less art kids get, the more it shows. Are yours getting enough? Art. Ask for more. Americansforthearts.org. has created over 14 million orphans worldwide. That's the equivalent of every child under five in America, with no one to watch over them. Please go to apathyislethal.org. Welcome back to Inside History and our guest, Tony Marconi. If you're just joining us, we have spent uh, quite a bit of today's show, actually, talking about the Miccosukee and the Seminole Indians. And now we learn that before the Seminoles and the Miccosukees came, there were cultures and people here before them. So, Tony, can you fill us in on those people, and who were they? Sure, Bob. This particular education program, part of the Traveling Educational Trunk Program, mm -hmm. is on the ancient people of South Florida, the Calusa, the Tequesta, and the Yega. They were the tribes that were inhabiting South Florida at the time of European arrival in the 1500s. So what we did is we decided to put together this program that talks about these early Indians and some of the artifacts that they would have used in their everyday life. We got a hold of Bob Carr, Florida archaeologist who has been working on the Miami Circle, mm -hmm. and he referred us to a gentleman that does reproduction Indian artifacts, that he, he actually works with Bob. And so we got a hold of him, and he did a whole bunch of reproductions for us. Mm -hmm. Can't get the originals because those are in museums or in collections right. for study and stuff, and we, we don't want the originals going out. So that's why we had reproductions uh, made for us for this, this program. Uh, some of the interesting items that we have in this is the shark tooth tool. Now, South Florida didn't have deposits of a type of stone called chert which many Native Americans throughout the nation have used to make their tools. Mm -hmm. So the South Florida Indians were pretty ingenious in what they would do. So they'd catch sharks, you know, consume them for food, but they also used the bones. 
And the teeth are really good for word working because the teeth are sharp. Yes, they are. And they would drill holes in them and attach them to wood handles or bone handles, and they would carve the, the artifacts or, or items that they would need to use in everyday life. Now, do you suspect that they might have used the, the carving to do the carving on something like that? Oh, absolutely. They would have used you sh shark teeth tools. Matter of fact, they would have even used barracuda teeth mm -hmm. mounted the same way to carve something like this. And this looks like a hatchet, or is that a tomahawk? No, it's not. This is a, called a celt, and they would have used this in woodworking. But you're right, it c could have been used as a weapon. Mm -hmm. This is based on one that was found in the 1890s at Key Marco, uh, a site on southwest Florida coast. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, produced by the Calusa Indians. It's very beautiful. Oh, the, yes. The artwork uh -huh. on it. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's wonderful. And could you show us this tool over here? This looks like a machine. You're, you're right, Bob. This is called a pump drill. Now, you know, just like we have a drill today with drill bits and you drill a hole or whatever you need. Right. Well, they did the same thing. You know, right. make their necklaces. They had to make holes in some of their other everyday items. So they used a pump drill. And Tony, what time period are we talking about here? This is before 1500. And they would, as a matter of fact, they would have continued using this uh, right through the early period of contact with the Spanish. But they would also have been trading for Spanish goods like the iron knife, steel knife, things mm -hmm. like that. They were also great scavengers. Shipwrecks that dotted the coast after the Spanish plate fleets would sail by, get destroyed by hurricanes. Uh -huh. They'd go raid the, the wrecks for stuff that they could use. But this one, this is a wood pump drill. And it has a drill bit, just like we would attach today. This is this stone here is chert. Like I said, it's, it's not found in South Florida, so they would have traded. So that shows that there were trade networks well established within these different tribes mm -hmm. you know, that, that scattered throughout the uh, Florida and in North America. So they'd attach it. And they put it in a little hole. Where do you think like that this chert might, they might have traded it for? Uh, there are chert deposits in Central and North Florida. I see. That okay. they could have traded for. And so what they would do, say we're, we're going to make a, a shell item for a necklace. Right. So we have to drill a hole, of course, to attach it. Right. Okay. So they would set it down and they would pump up onto the item to be drilled. And then they would move it up and down, just like this. And they would drill it until they got a hole in it. And I'll show you that this thing actually works. Oh, my. I didn't See? To, yeah. See the powder left from the, the <laughs> drilling the hole? Matter yeah, of fact, this one's almost done. It looks like it's almost broken through. Yep. The kids are allowed to do this. Of course, under adult supervision. Mm -hmm. We also have ones that are just wood with no sharp ends and stuff and a piece of block of wood that they can actually do. And it's, it doesn't, doesn't do anything, but it gives them the idea of you know, how these early Native Americans, their tools mm -hmm. would work. What's the oldest piece that you have here represented? Represented, the oldest piece would probably be this piece here this but we actually included we have three of these trunks because we're such a large school district mm -hmm. we included in each trunk an actual pottery shard real it's not reproduction this is the real deal but you can actually hold this and how old would you say this is oh that that could be uh, a thousand uh, 500 years old, oh my. and the, the, of course everything else is, is reproductions. Right, yeah, right. Well, they're good reproductions also. Mm -hmm. You have some beautiful artwork over here in these photographs. Right. Who are they? Well, we have a total of, of 12 pieces. Uh, this is part of the 
Lost Tribes of Florida series done by Florida artist Theodore Morris. Uh, we acquired these from him and we did uh, a certain selection of Calusa Indians mm -hmm. to Cuesta and we have a couple of the Yega. The, the one here on the on the right showing the just the male, that's a Yega Cacique. Cacique was chief. Mm -hmm. The other one is of a Calusa Indian man and a boy and the man is there carving a wood mask much like the mask that's on your left and if you look at the look at the picture you can see some of his tools and of course he's using some of the shark teeth tools to uh, work on that mask. Mm -hmm. Now when when the masks are created mm -hmm. what research is done in order to find the patterns or uh, uh, the authenticity of the mask? Good question. Photographs and drawings were done in the 1890s when Key Marco was excavated. And so we have those photographs and drawings. They're in the Smithsonian Institute. So it's how we know what these masks look like. That's how we know how some of these artifacts actually looked. And so we're able to take those photographs and the descriptions and actually recreate those. Mm -hmm. And Key Marco is over Marco Island? That is correct. In the Gulf? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, some of the books that you allow the teachers and the students? Yes, we have, of course, Florida's Lost Tribes. It shows a lot more artwork of the early F Floridians mm -hmm. and, and the artist, Theodore Morris, consulted with archaeologists, looked at collections to be sure what he was putting to paper was accurate. Right. And some of the interesting things is, you know, you see the earrings that they used were made out of wood or shell. They also used fish bladders, <laughs> if you can imagine that. Uh, there's this. We have uh, a craft book of the early Floridian, uh, how they made stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty cool because there's some things in there that the teacher can actually do. Mm -hmm. This is a Y loom that we recreated based on the information from that book. And this Y loom, they can actually weave into make sure this actually worked, I did it using some jute twine and created this little thing here, but you can actually, yes, uh-huh, and that was created using this. It feels like a very rough burlap. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, it also shows you how to make cordage out of local fibers, and all these were made from the sable palm native mm -hmm. palm tree. This is made from the sable palm leaf. And See? how is that done? Using this instrument? No, no. You'd, you'd uh, take a few strands, loop it around like a nail, mm -hmm. and then you just follow the instructions and twist. And then you turn it a certain way and you have string. You could you actually use the palm fiber that's on the leaf, which is, is this. Coconut palm? No, this, this, all this is from the sable palm. All sable. Uh-huh. It's, you can peel this right off of the actual leaf, the filaments, right? and then you can make this. Yeah. And it also has fur on the trunk, and you can also take that fur and make, and then you could actually take this if you make enough, use your loom, mm -hmm. and, and make a weaving. Uh-huh, absolutely. So that's one activity that they can do uh, that's yes. in this book. We also have um, created another activity, making your own Calusa mask. And you see the example right there uh, that we did. How are, what are these carved out of, or are they plaster? Or? This is actually paper mache. Or what would they have used? Oh, they would have used wood Solid for their wood. mask. Mm -hmm. They carved it. Oh, yes, uh -huh. okay. like cypress. And using this tool Absolutely. Again, to carve mm -hmm. with. What was this? It's like a saw. This is, you're, you're absolutely right. This is a barracuda jaw made into a saw. And so they could just sit there and, and saw. Pretty ingenious. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. You know, fish hooks out of antler. You know, they could, the, the center part of a, a large uh, shell could be made into a chisel. And is that what this is? No, nope, this is, this here is a shell hammer or shell axe. This has got a point on it, so it would have been mm -hmm. an axe. Chop wood. Uh -huh. And what they did is, is they would have uh, uh, created a hole here, 
and then chipped away part of the shell until they got nice and strong and chipped out a notch, and then they would have jammed a, a stick through it, a handle, right. and they would have. Now, this could also have been a hammer. If it would have been flat, that would have been a hammer. In what areas mm -hmm. did the different tribes live in, like the Terquesta Indians and the Ice Indians? Okay. The Calusa lived along the southwest coast of Florida from about southern Palm Beach County down to uh, just south of Miami with the Tequesta Indians. Mm -hmm. From southern Palm Beach County into uh, the southern part of Martin County with the Yega. And to the north of them was the Ice Indians and they lived uh, all the way to Cape Canaveral. And then above them was another tribe, the Tamukoins, on the west coast above the Calusa with the Tocobaga around the Tampa Bay area. And then on the interior of South Florida, around Lake Okeechobee, you had the Belglade culture mm -hmm. that were thriving there, living in a freshwater environment as opposed to a, an ocean. Coastal saltwater. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, what plans do you have for um, either enlarging this program or what does the museum want to do? We hope to partner with other organizations to create education programs with the museum. Mm -hmm. uh, we are offering field trips to schools to come to the History Museum to learn about Palm Beach County history. And we'll be able to come to visit our museum and learn about where they live. Make sure that all of Palm Beach County's fourth and fifth graders will be able to go to our new museum as a class and participate in the programs that they have planned for you. And if you are not part of the fourth or fifth grade, then make sure that you go anyway, because it's going to be something for all of us to enjoy and look back and reflect on our past. Tony, I would like to thank you again for being with us today. Sure. We've really appreciated it. My pleasure. This. When you get a chance, and come over to the Richard and Pat Johnson Palm Beach County History Museum. I will be there. And thank you for joining Inside History. I'm your host, Bob Carter. Bye-bye.